Centuries before the word feminism gained currency, the Ursulines broke new ground for women. Sister Mary McCormick tells how. Thought Leaders is brought to you by Dominion East Ohio. The Ursuline Sisters were actually founded right at the time of the Reformation. So about 500 years ago in Italy, uh, our founder was a woman by the name of Angela Morici. At the time, she would have been an older woman, probably about the age of 60, and uh, she had never married. She also had never joined a convent. Uh, she wanted to live a way of life that was somewhere between being a wife and a mother and uh, a monastic. She didn't want to be a monastic either. And so lived uh, as a laywoman for many years, but eventually founded a company of women who would um, not necessarily in the beginning live together, although eventually that became the case, but they would be of service to the people of uh, her part of Italy. Uh, she was originally from kind of north central Italy. And uh, so that's how it started. From there, the Ursulines moved from Italy to different parts of Europe. Um, from Europe, they came to the New World. Uh, Ursulines were the first nuns to ever come to North America, 1639. So they came to Quebec. Uh, that was their first foundation here in the New World. And then uh, Ursulines were also the first to come to what is now the United States. Um, when they first came, they came to New Orleans. And uh, of course, at that time, it was a French colony. So I always make that distinction because um, there are other convents that claim to be the oldest convent in the United States, but that's because they were part of the 13 colonies. Uh, Ursulines were here earlier, 1727, but we didn't become part of the United States. We, the French Ursulines, until uh, 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase. And then the Ursulines were the first in Ohio. Uh, they originally came to Cincinnati in uh, 1845 and then to the Cleveland area in 1850. They came here to Youngstown and they were the first women religious in the Youngstown area in 1874. So we've been here um, about 144 years. It's a, it's a long history. And uh, so the Ursulines have always adapted to the culture in which they find themselves. They've always tried to be of service to the people wherever they are. Um, they were always invited by somebody else you know, to do a particular work. And they did that, of course. But then they also uh, very quickly adapted to the culture in which they lived and saw other needs and began to work at those needs as well. But it's always been about education. Um, education in the broadest sense of the term. Now, I know that uh, Ursuline sisters and many nuns are associated with teaching in Catholic elementary and high schools. And uh, that is a, an important part of the history. But in the beginning, and even today, it's education in the broadest sense of the term, that whole idea of education leading a person from one place to another, you know, kind of drawing them out. Uh, when St. Angela founded the community, there really weren't any schools per se, but she was helping young women to learn some uh, skills. You know, there wasn't exactly a job market for young women in the Reformation era but teaching them skills how to cook, how to clean, how to sew, how to teach children. And so that was a form of education. Um, eventually, Ursuline started convent schools. Part of the reason they started convent schools was because uh, the bishops wanted to uh, monasticize them and prevent them from going out. And uh, they thought, well, okay, if they're not gonna let us go out, we'll bring the girls in. And that's how convent schools got started. And so you then, went to Ursuline High School. I did. And did you know when you went to Ursuline High School that you wanted to become a nun? No, I didn't, not that early. Um, I had gone to uh, Catholic Elementary School, St. Christine's, and then to Ursuline. I think when I was in my early years of high school, you know, um, on the one hand, it was when lots of young women were starting to go to college regularly. It wasn't, um, you know, the, a previous generation. Some of them went, some of them didn't. Uh, so I thought, yeah, I definitely wanted to go to college, and I thought I wanted to be a teacher. But I, I would say it wasn't until I was a senior that I thought about religious life. But I did not enter immediately after high school. I went to college, Youngstown State, for about a year and a half before I entered. So uh, I entered in the middle of my sophomore year in college and uh, have been here ever since. What made you want to do that? 
Well, uh, I think there were a variety of things. One, I was, um, I was attracted to the idea of teaching. That was one of the things. Uh, second, I think, I was very much uh, drawn to the possibility of, of joining with uh, a group of like-minded women who were interested in the spiritual life and interested in uh, together trying to make a difference in the world and to follow God's will and to, um, to do that, you know, not simply as an individual, but as part of a larger group. And, um, you know, I, I was certainly inspired by the sisters who had been my teachers. And, uh, you know, I guess I thought about joining that group. And, and when it seemed to fit, it was like, oh, you know, I think this can work. Um, and it, it allows me the opportunity to, to do that kind of work, but to do it with other people who are also looking at the spiritual life and looking at trying to um, be attentive to God's will, not only for us, but for the, the larger community. And that's kind of exciting. But through the years, you've, you've gotten all these different degrees. You've got a doctorate in systematic theology. Yes. What is systematic theology? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, in, the, in the world of theology, we kind of have different divisions. And uh, part of it's scripture, part of it's history, part of it's morality, part of it's uh, liturgy. Um, what systematic theology does is take the insights of the whole scriptural tradition and the history of the church and try to um, uh, take also a look at the teachings of the church and to build that into kind of a coherent system so that it all does make sense. Uh, there's a fluidity and a continuity and um, the whole idea of contemporary systematic theology is to say, so how does this make sense to a person who lives in the early 21st century? How does it? <laughs> well, I spend my life doing that too. Um, I think, you know, I think at the heart of the church's teaching tradition is uh, this whole sense of uh, God's plan for all of creation. And God's plan for all of creation is ultimately salvation and redemption. And you say that gets, uh, that has become incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ. And using the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus as a starting point, we try to make sense out of every other aspect of our lives. Who we are as human beings uh, who live in a world of grace, uh, who live in relationship to others, and uh, kind of strive to live our whole lives uh, trying to, um, to first kind of uh, embody this uh, salvation and redemption and to seek forgiveness when we're not very good at it and to uh, always find better ways to do it. This order that you are the general superior of, mm -hmm. how, how many nuns are there? Currently, we have 43 members of the Ursuline Sisters of Youngstown. And those numbers, are they dwindling? Uh, they have, they are and they have. Uh, probably at our largest, um, we were probably around 200, and that would have been in the late 1960s. Um, I would say in the Western world, the largest influx of uh, women into religious communities happened in the years after World War II and prior to 1970. And so uh, for those years, from say 1945 until about 1970, there were large numbers of women throughout the United States, Canada, Western Europe, entering religious life. Um, but for a whole host of reasons, many of those women left. We haven't had as many enter into uh, religious life in the years intervening, and, and so we have far fewer numbers now than we have had. Um, How do you recruit? Can you recruit? Well, uh, we certainly do work at recruiting. Um, and there are, there are a number of ways, you know, I think in the past, there was kind of a, uh, a natural recruitment in that there were also large numbers of students in Catholic schools. So it was true that not only lots of young women became sisters, uh, lots of young men became priests or religious brothers. Um, and they probably got their initial inspiration from Catholic schools. Uh, there are fewer Catholic schools now. 
fewer priests and religious teaching in those schools. So it's um, that kind of initial attraction doesn't always uh, have a, a, it's not always as strong as it was. Um, now, um, for the most part, we try to look at uh, working with young adults, and that's where our primary efforts are now. Um, we have set up a house uh, where one of our sisters uh, lives, so it's her residence, the convent she lives in, but she uses it as a place where young adults can gather for faith sharing, they can gather for um, their own study and their own kind of planning for their work, whatever work they're doing. Many of them are still in college or in graduate school, and so it gives them a place to study. Uh, but they do gather for prayer and meals and, and gathering that way. And um, you hope that some of them will? We do. We, we think that that's a possibility. You know, um, uh, as I had mentioned to you, I entered when I was a sophomore in college. That was pretty typical in those days. I entered in the mid-70s. Uh, it was very typical that people entered our community right after high school um, or uh, just a little bit after that. Today, it's far more common that people think about religious life uh, after they've finished college. You know, um, just like the age for marriage has moved up, the age for people thinking about religious life or the priesthood has also moved up. Uh, plus, you know, young people have so many more choices now. Um, and young women. And young women in particular. You know, uh, I think one of the interesting things, not that this is a complete cause and effect, but one of the interesting things, um, if you were a young woman, in, a Catholic young woman in the 40s or 50s or even in the early 60s, and you wanted to be a leader, uh, the best place to do that was as a nun in the Catholic Church, um, when almost no other institution would have had a woman as a elementary school principal or high school principal or college president or president of a hospital, Catholic uh, institutions had those. And so, again, I don't think it's, an, it's a one-to-one -one correlation necessarily, uh, that that's the only reason people entered, but women certainly had a lot of opportunities for leadership, for higher education, for uh, great responsibility in institutions that were run by uh, communities of women, women religious. Yet there's still that glass ceiling. You can't become priests. Well, there is there is a glass ceiling, although in the church we can tend to call Stained it a... Glass <laughs> Stained glass ceiling? Stained glass or opaque. <laughs> opaque in the sense of uh, you know going in, um, that there's not, uh, ordination is not a question that the church is willing to engage uh, at this point. Although Pope Francis has begun a uh, conversation about women as permanent deacons. That's the first kind that's of official first conversation, right? Uh, and that's already kind of a, a dramatic move from anything that's been done in the past. Um, one of the things that is the case in the church though, uh, as I said, women already had a lot of leadership positions. Now, in part because of a clergy shortage and in part because it just seems like a natural you know, progression of things. Uh, women are taking many more leadership roles in positions that had been exclusively uh, the place of priests. For example, uh, in many dioceses, the person who's uh, the chancellor is now uh, a woman who would have a background in canon law, a background in theology. You know, it's a position that can be filled by someone other than a priest although until rather recently, that would not have been the case. So um, you are finding, uh, though women are not ordained, and so they're not pastors, they're not bishops, they're not uh, priests or cardinals, uh, they, many of them do have positions of um, leadership in the church. When it gets to some of the higher decision making, not always so much, uh, but at least there's a voice at the table. Thought Leaders is brought to you by Dominion East Ohio. For information on programs, services, and community engagement, visit our website.